this is Brooke, and um, I'm going to be your host this evening. I'm the um, current president of the Central Chapter. Sorry. Um, I'd like to introduce Karen Lemire. Karen has been working in the field of natural resources for over 30 years and is currently the naturalist for Carmel Clay Parks and Recreation. Her past experiences include naturalist work at um, Eagle Creek Park, Mary Leah Environmental Center, Wisconsin DNR, and Riverbend Nature Center. She received her bachelor's degree in biology from um, Olivet. Olivet? Olivet. Olivet. Yeah. Olivet College. Olivet. <laughs> and a master's in fisheries and wildlife from Michigan State University. Karen is a um, Native Plant Society Central Chapter board member, Carmel Clay Parks naturalist, and she is a descendant of the Ho-Chunk Nation. Her grandfather was born in a wigwam in La Crosse, Wisconsin, and tonight Karen will share stories and information on plants and animals used by her ancestors and in her daily life today. Karen, at that, with that, um, I'm going to go ahead and allow you to share your screen. Okay. okay. A few more people in here. Ready? Go. <laughs> Woo, how's that? Did that work? That's perfect. Thank you. Okay. I am Karen Lemire. And yes, uh, my family has a uh, background in as Ho-Chunk. Ho-Chunk is from Wisconsin. And basically we are, we changed our name back to our original name in 1993. And basically probably what people are familiar with is I am a Wisconsin Winnebago. Alrighty, so uh, yes, I had an aunt that drove a motor home. Yes, she was a Winnebago Indian and she put a bumper sticker on her vehicle that said, I'm a Winnebago and proud of it. So we always kind of teased her about that. Uh, one of the things that we typically do in the culture that I'm from is that we kind of give, first of all, our background or kind of a little bit of our lineage. As if I meet another native person that's a Ho-Chunk, then I would kind of go through who I am, who I'm related to and that kind of thing. And then we kind of know who we are and where we're at. So I am Karen Lemire. I am the daughter of Francis Lemire, who is the son of Paul Lemire that was born in La Crosse, Wisconsin. And his mother was Delina Godfrey. And his father had been given a Christian name of Moses Lemire. But as you can tell by the name Lemire, Lemire is French. And it actually means the mother. So that's kind of my background. So if I had met another Ho-Chunk, they would know exactly where I fit kind of in the clan system and that type of thing. So what we're gonna talk about tonight is I'm gonna talk about the native use of nature's bounty. And instead of just talking about plants, uh, as a native person, I can't really separate plants and animals because they're all kind of interconnected here. So we're gonna talk about both. So it's obvious this is my first uh, ever Zoom presentation. Okay, so what I, we have here is a map of Wisconsin, and I'm showing you where the ancestral land is of the Ho-Chunk Nation. And one of the maps is showing you the big pink area where the star is. That was where uh, the original land of Ho-Chunk, and then you can see the other tribes that are actually represented in the state of Wisconsin. So we have lots of different tribes that are there, nations as we refer, refer to ourselves, and those are located in there. Now we actually have, uh, we have a treaty that uh, my mother passed away in 1992, my father had passed away in 1972, and in 92 we were, if anyone's had the fine experience of cleaning out the family home, and this is a home that my father grew up in also. So uh, we had that fine opportunity and we are picking up a sewing, uh, it's a sewing, uh, what, dresser, table or something like that. It's a sewing drawers and stuff. And it had the thread and all that kind of stuff, the buttons and all that. And we discovered it had a false top. And on the top, when you opened it, there were a number of papers in there. 
And I am a kid that grew up in, I was born in the 50s, grew up in the 60s and the 70s. And if there's anyone out there that grew up in that time period, kind of think about what was going on at that time. We had a lot of uh, kind of upheaval in our country at that time. And a lot of different ethnic groups were um, kind of fighting for rights and that type of thing. So when we found this, we'd look at it. And I had been raised knowing that I was Native American, but it was something we didn't talk about because it was not politically correct then to make comments that you were Native, all right? Uh, because when one group of people could ride the bus but had to ride in the back of the bus, I'm not sure if people understand Native Americans, we could not ride the bus. So we could not even get on the bus. We had to walk and things like that. So we just kind of kept it under our hat that we were native. So when we found all this paperwork, I looked at my aunts and uncles, which were my father's uh, brothers and sisters. And I said, a little bit Indian. And they said, we need to talk, Karen. And since then we sat down and talked about it. And they're, you know, they have since I believe gone to uh, Black River Falls and kind of followed the family lineage and that type of thing. We currently, the land that we had was ceded territory. So the pink area that you're seeing on the map that says Ho-Chunk, now that is no longer belonging to Ho-Chunk. That is all land that was ceded territory or sold uh, during, during the 1800s. The treaty that we had was from or have is from 1837. And I'm very honored to say that the land that my family originally occupied in the La Crosse area and also Prairie du Chien, mainly Prairie du Chien, is, um, is now a wildlife refuge along the Mississippi River. So I think it's pretty neat. We can go back. There's a number of islands out there after the Iron Army Corps of Engineer had uh, re-put in the lock and dam system then uh, this land there is some of my family's original land where my original ancestors were living and that type of thing. So it's really kind of interesting to go back and look at that. My family did not stay in the area. We moved from, my grandfather was born in La Crosse. My father was born in Milwaukee and they moved from the La Crosse Prairie du Chien area because, uh, during that time period, the water was not good. There was a lot of cholera and that type of thing. So they wanted to get out of that area and move more to a city where the water was better and children had a greater chance of survival. My uh, father had had a brother that was older. Well, he had passed away due to cholera. And so they moved to Milwaukee. And then from Milwaukee, they eventually moved to the Chicago area and from Chicago, we moved to Kalamazoo. And I grew up along a river, the Kalamazoo River actually in Kalamazoo, Michigan. So that's kind of how we moved around. Like all tribes, we were nations. We were uh, removed from our land. We did not have to walk like the Trail of Tears, like the Cherokee folks did. We were actually loaded onto boxcars and then we were taken out to Nebraska. There is a Winnebago uh, section of our tribe that is in Nebraska, and they are sharing a reservation right now uh, with, they have been for years, uh, in the uh, Lincoln Omaha area where they are, are at now. And it was interesting because when I was growing up, I learned a lot that um, I would hear from, uh, from some of the stories when my grandfather or my father was younger, that um, my grandfather would actually hop a boxcar and take off for a while. Well, you know, nobody ever talked about it or where he was going or anything like that. But my guess is that he was going out to Nebraska to see the rest of his family and relatives that were out there. He is a person, my grandfather was one that was uh, basically taken from his home. He was put in a uh, Indian school where the language was taken away and that type of thing. And he stayed there from about the time from what I've read and heard from my, my aunts and uncles is he probably stayed there till about, about the age of 16. And then he left there 
and he married, went to work on a farm, and he basically married the farmer's daughter. And then from there, they moved on to the different areas that I have talked about earlier. So what I'm going to do now is we're going to share, I'm going to share uh, some of the things I learned growing up. So a lot of... Um, a lot of it we talked about, a lot of it we didn't talk about. So this is just, this will just be things that I learned from my father and my grandfather, you know, kind of hanging around with them. And I've always had an interest in the outdoors and I've always had an interest in nature. One of the things that we learned as I have learned throughout my life and even as a young child, that growing up, that we are part of nature. We're not separate, we're not above it, and we're not over it. So we are not ruling over it. I've learned we must live in harmony with all plants and animals. We do not rule over them. As I said, we're part of them. We have to respect all living and non-living things. And that includes rocks and all that type of thing. And we have to remember to use what you need and always leave something to replenish the earth. So if you're out foraging or harvesting plants for use, or deer or anything like this, you have to leave some, especially the plants, to be able to reseed themselves so that you will have that population of plants in the future. And I also was taught throughout my life never to poison the earth, to respect it. So everywhere I pretty much worked, um, you know, and even at our own home, we do not use any lawn chemicals, excuse me, or anything like that. There are some natural plants you can use, but I know it's very hard when we are removing invasives in areas. So I do understand that. And I do think that it's done very respectfully. So I do not have a problem with that at all. So we're gonna talk tonight about uh, things from nature's bounty. We're gonna talk about things for food, shelter, decoration or ornamentation, or regalia that we wear, Native Americans. Uh, I know Halloween's a very interesting time because you see people that are dressed up, quote, as Indians. Um, we don't dress up in costumes. When we go to powwows and other gatherings, we are wearing what's called regalia. And we have certain attire we wear for certain events and that kind of thing. So. Um, so that's, that's in relation. Anyone has more questions on that, we can talk about that too. And I'm also gonna talk a little bit about plants that are used for medicine. But I do not like, I'll be honest, to recommend plants for medicine because it all depends on the quantity of the plant you're using or the quantity of the plant, what you're using, how you're mixing it and how you're um, you know, gonna utilize it, that type of thing and what the person's needs are. Because, you know, as we know, all plants for medicinal value and things, they do not have the same type or the same amount of the chemical in it or whatever particular thing you're looking for. They're all different based on their habitat, their water source, sunlight, and that type of thing. So, okay. So let's talk about one of the first creatures from nature's bounty that actually is something that brought a lot of Europeans to this country besides land. Oh, I hear somebody. <laughs> okay, or maybe that's me. So uh, yes, this is now, if, I, if you are we're sitting here, I'd ask you what this is, but I would bet 99% of you know, this is the American beaver. And this is a creature that was used for uh, lots of things in my culture. And first of all, uh, as we know, the trappers, the French fur traders came over, and this is the creature they were looking for. They were mainly looking for beaver pelts and other pelts. Beaver brought the greatest amount of value and money to the native people and also to the hunters and trappers that were here. Now, whenever we as natives use an animal or harvest an animal, we have some rituals we go through in regards to the respect for thanking the animal for it's, um, you know, for its use. And then we use pretty much all of the creature. We're not going to just, uh, you hear about Africa where the rhino horn is cut off and then the rest of the animal is left there and is not utilized. We would utilize the pelt 
for moccasins, for carpets, for robes, uh, the bones and things could be used for ornamentation. And one other thing that we did do that a lot of people I know, I don't want to gross anything, anybody out here, but eating the tail of the beaver was a delicacy because it is very high in fat. And if you are living in Wisconsin and you are living in a non-heated log house or long house or wigwam, you're gonna burn a lot of fat. So you're going to need that. And this is something you could get from the beaver tail. We would use the bones for different, um, you know, different tools and those kind of things. So the American beaver was one of our very, very beneficial critters out there. A lot of them would be trapped in the uh, wintertime because their pelts are actually thicker then. And there's, there's ways to tell which is a good beaver pelt and which one is not and how to, you know, how they would be priced and that kind of thing based on their fur texture and how thick it is and that type of thing. So this is another critter. And I know down here in Indiana, I don't believe we have any of these here. I haven't seen any, but uh, if we did, it would be probably in the Northern part, but I don't believe this animal occupies uh, Indiana. This is a porcupine. And the porcupine was again, another creature. It was active all winter. It's not one that hibernated as the beaver. It was active all winter. And one of the things that we were after specifically with the beaver is the quills. And you can see this one's a little irritated. It's got its tail sticking up and we would actually, and you don't have to have, you can harvest these from the live beaver by basically throwing a towel or a skin or something on the back of the beaver and just pulling it off. I have done this to some that are no longer living <laughs> that are by the side of the road. And that's another story, but we would use these. And these are the quills, <coughs> excuse me, that would come off of the beaver. And these are dyed different colors. And the way we would get these colors, <clears throat> if they're more subtle, they would be from natural plants. The darker reds and your blues, we would have an agreement with a number of the paper companies that are up in Northern Wisconsin, and they have dyes that they would use when they would dye paper different colors. And we would use some of that dye. We would get like a scoop out of the barrel that is being you know, discarded, that type of thing. And then we would soak the quills in that. And we could do a whole separate class <clears throat> or program on how to process porcupine quills, <coughs> excuse me, and what to do with them. So those are used a lot for, uh, you can use them for tools. I've made fish hooks out of them. I've also made needles out of them for sewing. But the main thing we would use them for is ornamentation. This is before contact where, with glass beads and that kind of thing that we would get. So the quills are actually flattened and then they are woven. You can see on one side here, these are leggings or kind of like gaiters that we wear today in the snow. And the quill work is woven in there and put into it. I have done a little bit of this, but I'm not real proficient at it yet. And then on the other side, you're seeing what's called a porcupine quill. Um, it's like a little basket or a little vessel to carry things in. And this would be something for decoration. This would be something that would be given to someone to bring it. Go ahead. Question? Nope. This would be given during a ceremony, that type of thing. And uh, there is a turtle on that, and there's an entire legend about the turtle. And the turtle is very important to a number of uh, Midwestern uh, Algonquin tribes and also uh, Ho-Chunk. We are Siouxian in language, meaning we speak a very similar language to the Sioux. So we are descendants also of the Sioux tribe, which you are probably familiar with, that is farther west, North Dakota, South Dakota. But originally, we were all kind of an intermingled group. We're also going to talk about another critter I know as uh, lovers of plants. 
This is one of the last things we want to see that's coming near our gardens and near our homes. But this is a white-tailed deer. And this is a creature that would subsidize our life throughout the wintertime in regards to food. Also antlers were used for everything from buttons to uh, handles on spears, ax handles, that type of thing. Uh, the skin was used for carpeting in your home. If you're living in a wigwam and you have you know, a dirt floor, this would be what you would put down on the floor and this would be your carpeting. Also, you can make a jacket out of it. And we also would use the bones and the sinew, which is the tendons in the inside of the deer and the foot. And that would be used as a rope and that type of thing. But then after contact with, um, you know, the first Europeans that came here, we used, you know, we would also use, you know, string and that type of thing. Now, I don't want to gross anybody out with this one either, but the stomach of the deer would be used for cooking. It is the area that originally before iron pots made it to the U.S. or to the North America. And the stomach of the deer, when the deer was, was killed, then the stomach would be cleaned out and it would be one of the rumens in there would be cleaned out or the rumen cleaned out and you could uh, cook in that as long as you kept it wet on the outside, you could boil things in it and cook food in it. So here's another creature that was very common and also something that we uh, used a lot. This is a red-eared slider. Uh, we used more painted turtles. So this one is probably could be considered one that this is, came from the pet store trade and released in a lot of our ponds and things, but it was the painted turtle that we originally would use. We'd make food out of it, soups, that kind of thing. Uh, the shells, we would use the shells, could be utensils before you had you know, before you had a glass plate, you had to have something to eat out of. I was actually have a funny experience. I was down in the Smokies uh, leading a hike. And one of the programs that I do is uh, native use of nature's garden down there. I had a Cherokee friend and we would do a joint program there. And it absolutely started to pour down rain. I have, as you know, it rains a lot in the Smokies. And I would... Um, I had my rain jacket, but I did not have my rain hat. I will tell you that a large snapping shell turtle, if you park it on the top of your head, will make a wonderful rain hat. I will tell you, I also looked a little ridiculous at one point. And I see that Betsy Wilson is probably on here and she's probably laughing right now because she had the opportunity to observe me running around in the Smokies with a turtle shell on my head. Besides, you know, using a turtle for food, whoops, we would also use a turtle for, um, you know, for and I, for uh, things in regards to dance and in ceremonies and that kind of thing. I'm not going to talk at all about religion uh, because that's a very private matter in our tribal background and that type of thing. Also, I'm going to mention is that I am not speaking for all Ho Chunk people. I am just speaking for myself and what I learned as a as a youngster and as an adult, you know, growing up Ho Chunk and you know, learning about my own culture. So each of us have each native person has different experiences in their life. And we can't really, you know, I'm not going to speak for the whole whole tribe or the whole nation, that kind of thing. So this is just stuff I've learned throughout the years here. Now we're going to talk about this creature. And again, probably the last thing we want to see milling around our backyards. But before we get into the plants, periodically I am asked is how do we know what to eat early on and what was going to be toxic and what was not? And what, you know, what we could eat, what we could not eat. We would watch early on in our in some of the stories I've heard and that type of thing. We would we would watch what we call the two eyes, the ones that have their two eyes on the front of their head and are considered to be a lot like us. And that would be things like raccoons and bears 
Because if you notice, when you look at a bear, they're looking straight at you. And both the raccoon and the, whoops, the raccoon and the, whoops, I'll figure this out, and the black bear, they're omnivores, just like we are. And they have a similar digestive system, that type of thing. But I will tell you, some mammals can eat a box turtle, even if the box turtle has eaten an Amanita mushroom. If we were to eat a box turtle that ate an Amanita mushroom, that could kill us. So do not eat, and that's one reason never eat a box turtle, besides the fact that it's a protected species here. So let's talk a little bit about the plants here. And we'll start out by talking about um, some of the things my father always did, depending on, excuse me, the time of the year, is when we were in Kalamazoo, Michigan, is he had certain places that he had grown up because he grew up in the same area uh, that his father would take him to where he knew all the berry bushes and the berry trees. And if they were in public, he's not gonna go in someone's front yard, but if they were in public parks or something like that, he had his little list based on the season of the year as to where he would go out and find these things. One thing that we would do is go out and look a lot for wild strawberries. And in my mind, nothing beats a wild strawberry. You can get the gigantic ones at the store, but wild strawberries are the best. They're the sweetest, they're fantastic, they are absolutely wonderful. And, um, but you have to get to them nowadays before the raccoon, the deer, and everybody else gets there first. So we had his own little berry patch that he would go to. We have since planted our own berry patch in our yard. So we do have some strawberries and things there. Before we talk about what to eat and what not to eat out there is if you're actually harvesting things or foraging for things, uh, you'll have to check with your park systems and make certain that you are not in violation of what the rules are for that area. And if you're going along the edges of roads, uh, make certain that you're far enough off the road that you are not getting any of the emissions that are coming out of vehicles that are on those plants. Or if you're getting it out of water, that it's not a polluted water. Years ago, we had, you know, the rule was never eat anything by the side of the road because gas had lead in it. And from the emissions, you would get lead poisoning and you want to avoid that. So um, strawberries were a big one. We also went after elderberries. And in regards to elderberries, uh, elderberry was a very useful plant and still is. We could, well, as we know, in arsenic and old lace, they made elderberry wine, uh, but you don't wanna get any arsenic in there. But you could take the flowers and that could be dipped in a batter and made into something called a fritter and we would fry that in bear fat and it would be dipped in flour that could be made from nuts, that type of thing. And also the twigs of an elderberry are hollow. And the first uh, spiles that were used in maple trees were from elderberries. And we'll talk a little bit more about maple here in a little while. So we also had, um, we, have black, we have black raspberries and we have since planted some black raspberries at our home. And here at the Monon, uh, we have to try to beat the deer to even taste the black raspberry or the, red, the black, yeah, the black raspberries. We also have blackberries too. I'm not as fond of black, blackberries as I am black raspberries. So hence you get to see black raspberries. Uh, another thing we had were mulberries. And I know some mulberries are, not particularly uh, liked here as they're more an invasive in some areas, but where I grew up, we did have mulberries and there's a little mulberry caterpillar on there. But uh, yeah, mulberries were very tasty. We would wait till they, uh, you know, got completely dark. And then, you know, mulberries are tricky. They're either gonna be okay, or they're gonna be very, very bitter or very sour, so kind of in between there. My cousins would come over and we'd all go up in the mulberry tree and sit around and eat mulberries. So 
till we got a tummy ache and then we'd all go inside and you know complain we had a belly ache. So blueberries in the northern part of Michigan, we have uh, blueberries and there are, uh, if you're up in the UP of Michigan and in Wisconsin, there are blueberry bushes all over and they're wild blueberries. They're gonna be very small and they are not gonna be as big as the ones that we get in the store today. So blueberries are very tasty. Uh, in Wisconsin, we had in the boggy areas and the wet areas that we would have a lot of wild cranberry and wild cranberry would be harvested in the fall and it would be floated on the water. If you look at uh, how it's harvested out in, uh, I think it is out in Massachusetts and those areas where it's floated, this would grow along the edge of a bog and then bog being more acidic so or more yeah more acidic soil and then uh, these would float on you know when you'd harvest them you'd float them on the top of the water you might go out in your canoe and gather them up in that particular fashion but uh, and we would add they're a little tart when you, if you're just eating a straight cranberry at uh, Thanksgiving we would add some maple syrup to it or some maple sugar to make them a little more palatable. So one of my dad's favorites is gooseberry. And he had his own little gooseberry spot in one of the parks near uh, in Comstock area where I grew up, Comstock, Kalamazoo. And he was very upset when he went out there one day and it was at a park and it was kind of hidden in the back. He had to go back in the woods and stuff. And someone else had discovered his gooseberry bush. And this is one of the only berries that you can actually eat that is a whitish green color. You generally want to stay away from berries that are white or green because typically they are toxic. So I'm thinking of poison ivy, poison sumac, that kind of thing. So one of my favorites, and this is something that um, I've taught my son to do, and also we do here at the Monon Center. And just about every place I've ever worked is we have tapped maple trees and we have made maple syrup and maple sugar and uh, maple candy, that type of thing. This is the sugar maple and you can take a look at that. They're a little bit, they generally have bright yellow uh, leaves on it and they're very, very pretty. I'm also a Green Bay Packer fan uh, being from Wisconsin. So everyone says that nature is even a Packer fan because when you look out there, things are yellow or gold and green, just like the Packers are. So here's how uh, we tap maple trees. I do not use tubing. I do the traditional method. I did actually go to some plastic buckets because they're easier. And also because you have to have a lid on it. Because if you don't have a lid on it, the raccoon sticks his face in there and you will come down and he'll be gobbling, you know, he'll be slurping your, um, you know, your sap out of there. Uh, tradition that we have in our family is that we will thank the tree for producing the sap for us. And the very first thing we do when we tap the very first tree, when it's the sap is coming out and it is absolutely ice cold, is we take a cup and we put it under that tap or under that spile and we drink the first sap that comes out of the tree. And to me, it is, it's kind of like a rite of spring that you know it's going to be coming soon and that thing, you know, the frogs will be singing soon and that kind of thing. So you can look in there, it's very clear and it has just a little hint of sweetness to it. So it's not gonna, it's not gonna come out like syrup. And there is a Ho-Chunk legend about that. And um, we'll go through our plants and stuff. And then if you're interested in the legend afterwards, I can tell you the legend. I don't want to run out of time on that. Uh, you're looking over at the hand that's holding that. That's an original spile. And that would be made out of elderberry. And you can see that it's hollowed out. And the way that the first, uh, first trees were tapped is that there would be a slit that would be made in the bark of the tree. And then that spile would be pounded in with a rock. And then you would put like a birch bark basket 
that you have sealed with pine, pine sap so it's waterproof, and then you would gather it there. And to traditionally boil it down, you would take a log and you would hollow it out, and then you would put rocks in a fire and you would drop them in there and do not use certain types of rocks. Limestone is not good because first of all, it'll, the limestone will slough off in there and also it will crack and you do not wanna get hit with a flying rock that's uh, cracked. So granite was typically used in Wisconsin and Michigan areas. And then that just, you can see the steam coming off and that's how you would boil that. Another way would also be uh, inside, you know, the rumen of a deer and that would go over fire. You have to keep it moist on the outside and then you just let it boil. As everybody knows, it's probably 40 gallons of sap to one gallon of syrup. So you can see that when uh, maple season would come along, we would move to what was called a maple camp. And we would spend the month, uh, depending when it's above freezing during the day and freezing at night, we would spend the entire uh, month of probably February and March uh, making maple syrup. You couldn't go to the store and get a bag of sugar. So this is your actual sweetener for the rest of the, you know, rest of the season. Now, early on, before uh, contact with Europeans, we didn't have anything to carry syrup around. You can't carry syrup around and, you know, we didn't have a jar, we didn't have anything. So we made it into what are called sugar cakes. And they would be, this would be boiled down farther. Syrup, it turns to syrup at about 200 and, um, I think it's 219 degrees. And I think it turns into sugar uh, when it looks like this and you stir it. So it's about 200 and I guess another 10 degrees or so. So about maybe 220, 229, that kind of thing. So on a candy thermometer, it's about the softball stage that you're looking for. And you stir it and the grainier you want, don't stir it as much. The finer sugar you want, stir it and stir it and stir it and stir it. And it'll look a lot like maple, like uh, brown sugar. So, and if you want a sugar rush, this is it. So, okay. Another uh, plant that was very beneficial and very useful to Ho-Chunk is the black walnut. We have uh, planted black walnuts. Uh, my father planted a black walnut tree in our backyard when they moved to the area in Kalamazoo along the river when he was six. And he planted that walnut, it produced walnuts. And then, um, then when we moved to Indiana, we took some of the walnuts from that tree and have since planted a walnut tree in our backyard. So we have the descendant of that tree in our backyard. So I know I probably jumped ecotones there, but you know we're only 200 and some miles away. So. So this is the black walnut. And again, we would use black walnut for a lot of different things. These are the walnuts. If you see me in the fall of the year, you will see me with kind of orangish brown fingers from harvesting the walnut. The walnuts will come down off the tree. They will land on the ground. And if you get to them before the squirrel does, you have to remove the husk from the nut. And so you remove that lots of different ways. Uh, you can step on them. You can peel, we peel them off with our hands. Uh, nowadays we use uh, rubber gloves and things so we don't look you know, quite as dyed as we normally would. And then what we would do is we would let them dry from the time they fall on the tree and kind of the rule of thumb we follow at our house until Thanksgiving would give uh, and they have to be out of the hull to dry. And then we would just let them dry for that time period. And then on Thanksgiving or the day before, you would crack them open and they would be good to eat. Prior to that, they're kind of bitter. And if you know, they do have their own flavor. And then we would use them to make, um, we'd put them in candy. We'd also put them in dressing, you know, that's for the turkey and that kind of thing. So um, another thing we used them for is there's two different things we do. Uh, one, these husks could be used for fishing. The hulls could be. And typically both the Cherokee and the Ho-Chunk 
we would put those inside a basket. We would weave a basket out of, uh, in, uh, in North Carolina, Cherokee would weave it out of dogwood. We would probably weave ours out of willow. And then if you have a small pool in a lake, a river or a stream, and you would kind of block that off and you would drop those holes in there. The toxin from the holes would cause it to stun the fish momentarily. And then the fish would float to the surface in the area. And now mind you, you have to have a lot of holes and a lot of fish. So, you know, and so then they would float to the surface and you could pick up the fish. Now you put the fish into clean water and let them run that through their gills and their body before you would eat the fish because you don't, do not want to ingest the toxins that are in the hulls. Uh, FYI, that is illegal to do nowadays. So do not go out and try that. And for fishing, you need a fishing license and all of that. So, but that is a traditional way in which fish were caught uh, in Wisconsin and, you know, uh, North Carolina, those kind of things. So another thing we used was we would use a lot of plants, dye plants. And on this particular basket, the baskets that we make are made out of black ash. And that is gathered from the inner bark of the black ash tree. Uh, we're a little concerned that we're losing all our ash trees be, do the, due to the emerald, emerald ash borer because we are losing a traditional uh, basket making skill. You would um, harvest the bark or harvest the tree. You would keep the bark, you would pound the bark. And as the bark is pounded and comes off the tree, you make it into strips. And that's what the baskets are made out of. The one that is the darker color has black walnut uh, dye on it. And it probably has blood root on the top where the red is a little bit subtler. So that is your uh, blood root and black walnut. There's also probably some box elder in there too. Another very important tree, and my father had his own little hiding spot of these in the park, it would be uh, hazelnuts. And I will tell you, we just have acquired with Carmel Parks a new piece of property called Bear Creek. And I highly recommend everyone to take one of the tours that we're offering on the weekends out there. And the person that owned this land prior to our ownership of it did plant a number of nut trees. And there are quite a few hazelnut trees that are out there. I left them there for the critters, but it was really hard. So, but it's really neat to see them growing out in this area. Oak, oak is another common tree that we would use for everything. And we know how beneficial oak is now to our pollinators, to our native, plant, native species of insects, caterpillars, birds, everything. But we used it also as a food. And you can eat acorns. The white acorns, as this one is, taste better than the red acorns or the red oak tree, where you have to take the white acorns and again, you would harvest them, you would dry them, and then you would pound them into a flower. And you could eat the white oak in the first fall. So if you harvested them in the fall, you could eat that in, the, in that particular winter and you would keep it. Red oak, you cannot do that. It has a high tannic acid in the nuts. So you would have to actually soak them. Many times we would put them in birch bark uh, vessels, bury them in the ground, and then um, let water leach through them. Yes, some of them started to grow, but not all of them. Let the water leach through them for about a year, then dig them out the following year, and then you could make the flower, you could dry them and make the flower out of them. Now you have to leave enough for the squirrels and the other creatures to be able to replant it out there for you. So here are some of the other acorns that are out there. Hickory nuts are another very important one we have. And uh, my dad had his own little spot to find those too. So this is a shag bark hickory and hickory nuts are very tasty. Uh, you do not want to use uh, bitternut hickory. They are not at all tasty. I tried one once and 
Again, like all nuts, you have to let them dry from when they are harvested. And we would use the hulls for fire, uh, the bark. You could start fire with the bark, but generally you wanna leave it on there for the tree to survive. So you can see this many early on when we were living, you know, basically off the land, a number of our plants that we would, were nuts and berries. And also we did a lot of farming, Ho-Chunk, we were farmers and we would plant the three sisters. We would plant uh, corn, squash and beans. And we'll talk later about how we would plant those and how they would grow. Another common one, and we'll talk a little bit about this one's medicinal value too. This is the willow, the black willow. And where I grew up along the river, this one looks a lot like our willow tree. I will confess, I did borrow it from Google, but um, willow is awesome. It is one of the first things that uh, it has salicylic acid in it, which I'm sure everyone knows is aspirin. So, so if you have you know, a toothache or something, you can chew on it. it. You can make willow baskets out of it. We would also take the twigs, they're flexible, and we would weave mats to put in our homes. I have woven uh, willow mats. I've also woven cattail mats, that type of thing. But it's a great spot. To me, this looks like a great spot to sit right on that log and grab a fishing pole and just sit there for the day and see what you can catch. So here's the willow, what they look like up close. There are native willows, excuse me, and there are non-native willows. So we like the native ones. They're one of the first ones that start to yellow in the spring of the year. So that's helpful. Now we're gonna talk about some more of our herbaceous plants. We're gonna talk about uh, something called the doctrine of signature. And this is what was believed. And by some still, still do believe this, that uh, plants will show us what it would be used for based on its shape, its color, and how it looks, its bark, its roots, or its leaves. For instance, this one, I'm sure everybody knows this, this is hepatica. And if you turned it over, it has kind of a purplish color. The belief is that hepatica could be used for your hepatic system when it also would be something that you would use for your liver, because I guess we have three lobes to our liver. And if we, uh, I guess, look inside our liver, is about the same color as a hepatica on the underside. And some of the, this will have leaves that do remain out there green throughout the fall and sometimes early into the winter. So, and then their flower will grow the following year. So that would be used for things. Uh, this one, I know he's not native, but um, Pochunk were opportunists. If someone's gonna bring it along and it's edible and has a medicinal value to it, and mainly can sustain us, we're gonna eat it, okay? We're not gonna just, you know, let it sit there. So we do know this is one that uh, if you look at it and following that doctrine of signatures, this one looks like teeth. It looks like lion's teeth, hence dandel lion. And this one would be used for uh, things to do with your teeth. We all know all the different things we can make out of it. You make dandelion wine, uh, the old saying was, if you pick the flower and rubbed it on your chin, if it turned yellow, your chin, you liked butter. Well, I think that's going to happen to everybody because there's pollen on it. So, so that's uh, the greens are very good. They're very edible. One of the first ones to come out in the spring. If all you've been doing is eating, you know, nuts, dried berries and venison all winter, when you start to see a green plant, you're gonna go for it because you are missing, you know, that part of your diet at this time. So, and eat the small ones. You do have to, uh, if you're gonna eat the bigger ones uh, later in the season, you do have to boil it and throw the water off and then, you know, eat it, that kind of thing. So um, yes, we have the neighborhood that has dandelions in our yard and I'm sure all my neighbors hate me, but hey, they're the ones that feed the bees. <laughs> Hi, I'm given a program, come on in. <laughs> um, another one we look at and we really like is wild ginger. And this one 
is, um, as you know, the root kind of crawls along the ground. It has like a rhizome there, and it's kind of a fuzzy flower. You have to get down on your hands and knees, stick your nose in there, and give it a sniff. Uh, it will smell like rotting meat because it is a purplish flower, and that's pollinated by ants, carrion beetles, that kind of thing. But we, what I like to do is it grows very prolifically, and you can make something called candy ginger root. And you pull the ginger root up, and then um, what you do is we clean it off, and then I boil it in maple syrup. And then the maple syrup, as it boils off, will start to candy on the outside of the root. And then you mix that ginger, you know, ginger bite with something sweet. And I, it's very, very tasty. So uh, this is another early green plant and pretty much everything on violet is edible. Uh, the leaves are very tasty, pretty high in vitamin C. It's one of the things that um, we would eat early in the season when it's coming out with the dandelions and that. So yeah, violet leaves, I'm sure you've had, uh, you can dip violets. Uh, nowadays they're dipped in sugar and put on cakes. The violet flowers are. Uh, we would dip it in maple, syrup, maple sugar and just eat it. It was like a treat for kids and it was very tasty. Red bud is another plant that is, um, is edible. The flowers are edible on it. And it is one of the first ones that comes out. And you can pick those. They look great in a salad. If you have some violet leaves, you might have some dandelion leaves in there and then throw some red bud flowers on the top. And it's pretty darn tasty and pretty high in a number of the you know vitamins and minerals we've been missing all winter long and we haven't eaten. Uh, nettles, first thing we like to do is run away from nettles. But when nettles uh, first come out, uh, don't just pick it off the plant, eat it, or it's gonna poke your tongue and you're gonna be a little irritated for a while. But you can, you boil it. And as you boil it, then the little hairs that are in there are the part that's going to be very, uh, you know, poke at you. It's a lot like a jellyfish where you touch it, it kind of pops out and that's what stings us. Well, it gets rid of that. The boiling water will get rid of those. And I recommend the ones that we've eaten, we have boiled the water and strained it for at least three times. And we might've been just overprotective because we didn't want to get nettle stingers in our tongue. <laughs> so, but that's one that's also very good in the vitamins and minerals that we're missing. Oxide daisies are edible. I actually spent a summer uh, living on Garden Island with a, uh, not a Winnebago, but with a Ojibwa woman. And uh, we would eat, uh, we would go out and we would pick oxide daisies. And those would go in a salad too. So we would pick the greens that were out there and then we would throw the oxide daisy on top. I like the petal better than the uh, center part of it because the center part to me is pretty chewy. And I'm not a fan of broccoli. I can handle, you know, cauliflower, but I'm not a fan of broccoli. So there's oxide daisy. Everyone I'm sure is familiar with bergamot. This is what Earl Grey tea has in it. The bergamot flower, you use the leaves and you can boil that and make a tea. Uh, I love the smell of the uh, seed pod this time of year, just to pick it, pinch it and smell it. It could be used uh, it could also be used during, you know, in the fall and winter months, that particular particular seed pod, similar to something that grows down south called bubby bush, or would be used as a deodorant. Women would take the, the um, bergamot and then they could, um, yep, hold on a minute. <laughs> Okay. You guys, Karen is at work at the Monon Center tonight. Sorry, I'm in a room. Yeah, thank you. I'm in a room and somebody wanted to come in the door. So, yeah. <clears throat> so sorry, I had to kind of take care of that. So yeah, bergamot, you can use the leaves and you would take this time of year, take the seed pod that's out there after the seeds are gone and it would be pinched 
and you could put it in your clothing. So because we didn't have a lot of deodorant, didn't take a lot of baths in the winter, and that would, you know, kind of help with that. <laughs> and same with Daisy Fleabane, would be used to get rid of fleas. So, common milkweed, uh, it is an edible plant. I do not recommend eating it right now. I recommend leaving it out there for the monarch butterflies. But the part you eat are the, the uh, before the flowers open. If you look over on the side there, you've got the flower. And then on the other side before it opens, that part you would pick. And then you could boil that similar to your broccoli or cauliflower, but you have to boil it, throw the water off, boil it, throw the water off because of the sap that's in there. So, yep. But that's another good one too. Chicory, uh, if you've been to New Orleans, they put chicory in their coffee and we would use the root of the chicory for, uh, you know, for a drink, for a warm drink. And the, uh, it's a very bitter drink and it could be used for, oh, digestive issues, that kind of thing. So it would be one that, um, too much of it could make you sick. So if you had eaten something you wanted to get rid of, that would be something you might be given to get rid of that. Now this one I know is not native, but uh, this was used once the Europeans got here and it kind of followed everybody where they went. Uh, curly dock, the seeds on the top. If, uh, if you make like a cobbler or something, you can, you can use the seeds on top uh, for like, a granola or something. And that's a very useful one there. So I don't want to take the whole night here for you. Cattails. Uh, I've eaten a lot of cattails in my life. And uh, the part that I like best is down when you harvest the root of it, right where the stalk is, as the stalk uh, is connecting to the root and under the water, and it's the white part, it uh, when you clean it and then you peel it back and you eat the part that's, um, oh, it's, it's not, you're, don't try to chew on the leaf there. It's going to be very hard to chew, but um, it tastes a lot like celery if I was to compare it to something else. So, and again, uh, make certain that you're not taking it from any polluted waters. Now, when I was eating this, this was back, uh, this was probably in early 70s or so, and up when you could, you know, you can go into Canada and canoe and drink right out of the lakes. So nowadays, I probably wouldn't recommend that. You might wanna, if you harvest it, you could, you know, put it in, you know, clean water that you know is clean and let it kind of clean itself out for a while. We also would eat the root of the cattail, and we would also eat the pollen on the top. And this is, this is not the pollen part that you're looking at. I call it a hot dog on a stick. And this is the part that has the seeds in it. I went to work at Riverbend Nature Center in Wisconsin, and they were doing um, wild edibles for a fall harvest festival we were having. And I go into the kitchen at the Nature Center, and there is cattail fluff flying around everywhere. They were making cattail pancakes they had harvested the brown part of the cattail. This is a group of volunteers. And you don't harvest the brown part, you harvest the pollen, which is the bright yellow part that's on top of it. And you have to harvest that earlier in the season. Well, they thought the brown part was edible. And the biggest problem that they were having is you could not keep the cattail fluff in the bowl and it was flying all over the room. So we, we had a little educational, I called it a teachable moment then. So you don't wanna eat that part, but all of the cattail is edible. And we did, there is a native cattail that is around too. So those were, those were one of our substantial things uh, that sustained us throughout the winter. We would harvest that in the fall or in the summer, and then those would be dried and stored for winter eating. Another one we ate a lot of was uh, yellow water lily or spatter dock. And the women, we would gather that, and my I could never understand why my dad would always kind of try to teach us to use our toes for stuff, but Ho-Chunk women would go into the ponds uh, historically and while they are taking care of the kids and holding them above 
you know, above the water and things. They were using their toes to dig out the root of the yellow water lily. Sometimes it's called duck potato and we would eat that also. So yeah, and they're very tasty too. So, but yeah, don't forget to use your toes when you're out harvesting plants. Goldenrod, uh, I don't believe we ate a lot of goldenrod, but we did use it for a lot of, um, and I'm speaking of Ho-Chunk, other tribe might've used, you know, might've eaten it. We used it for a lot of uh, dyes and plant, and, uh, native dyes and that type of thing. So we would, you know, we could dye porcupine quills. Uh, you could also use it for weaving and those things. Jewel weed, I'm sure everyone under, knows the uh, benefit of jewel weed. Uh, this is the one that it likes to grow near poison ivy. So if you are, you know, get into poison ivy, pick the leaf, squish it, smear it on where you think you got the poison ivy or nettles, it'll stop the itch of nettles. Uh, we made a tincture of this and we would use it um, for any you know poison ivy or itch or anything that we got into. Another thing that you can do with a jewel weed or the touch me not is that if you touch the end of the uh, seed pod there, it'll pop open and the seeds inside of there, if you can catch them, they're very, very tasty. So they're very small, but they will, they're very good. So they're kind of a little special treat in there. Plantain, now this one is not native. And I know this one as a plant that goes by the name of white man's foot, that everywhere the wagons went and everywhere the white man walked across the land, this stuff would start to pop up. And you can look in any area that's disturbed and you will find plantain or plantain growing out there. There's a narrow leaf and a broad leaf. Uh, the venation of it, if you, you can identify it by turning it over and looking at the veins, doctrine of signature on this one is the belief that is good for your vascular system, okay? So it would help your blood. And again, the greens can be eaten with it. And, <clears throat> and it's pretty darn tasty, but don't eat it when it's uh, real big like that. Okay, purslane. Purslane is another plant that uh, farmers use. Uh, they, a lot of um, herbicides would be put on this in farm fields. It is an incredibly edible plant. It has, um, it's a very bitter flavor to it or it's kind of sour and it's very tasty. It is a succulent, likes to grow across the top of the ground. It is probably considered an invasive, but uh, native people, we would eat that. So that would be one that was rather tasty. Uh, Indiana bananas, or they were also found in Michigan. There's an area in Michigan called Pawpaw, Michigan, known for its wineries up there, if you've ever been up there. And this is the part this is the fruit that is edible. And this part would be used, uh, you know, you, you eat it. I say you pick it and then you let it get really squishy or you can when it, pick it when it's squishy. And I think it smells like dirty socks, but I have a coworker that thinks it's awesome. But uh, yeah, it is very tasty. There are some big seeds in there that you have to kind of work around but it is a good nutritional value in there. Red clover or any of the clovers are edible. Um, the leaves are edible, also the flower is. We would eat flowers a lot. And as all kids know, you can pu pull the flower out and suck the nectar out of it. Sassafras is a very common plant in Michigan. I haven't seen a lot of it here. It's really common in Wisconsin along uh, the Michigan Lakeshore. And sassafras is used for a lot of different things. Uh, you can make, uh, as we know, root beer is something that came from it. Sassafras twigs will start a fire very fast, even if they're wet or you have wet wood, if you have dry sassafras twigs and put into that fire first as you're kindling and your tinder, that will start the fire going. And you can tell us, Scott, it's got one leaf that looks like a mitten, one that looks like it's three-lobed, and one that's just 
has one lobe to it. So sassafras is pretty common and it's the root that would make the root beer out of it. So uh, spice bush is tasty. I love the smell of spice bush and also the spice bush berries are another tasty one. So you can make a tea out of spice bush and it's also, it's pretty good. And there's the spice bush butterfly it likes to hang out on it. Another one that's a non-native, but was used a lot is uh, staghorn sumac. And this is the one that has the fuzzy, uh, you know, the fuzzy twig, like a stag. And what you eat is, or what you can, you make lemonade out of is excuse me, the berries that are right in the center part there. When you're going to harvest it, a um, friend of mine, a Cherokee that went to a big uh, edible festival said there, everyone had made some sassafras lemonade and you put ice in it and you crush the berries. You have to strain it, it's kind of fuzzy, but just strain it and make sure, you know, you can use your teeth for straining too, if you want. But um, what you do is, um, Everybody was drinking all of the sassafras or the sumac tea or lemonade, except for one pitcher. And the one pitcher they were not drinking, come to find out, they had accidentally squished up a stink bug in there. And you have to look through those berries and really make certain that there's no stink bug hiding in there because you'll wreck your staghorn sumac uh, lemonade very fast with a stink bug in there. So as my entomology professor said, you can eat a lot of bugs, but don't eat a stink bug. So wild carrot, and I know it's not native, but uh, this one is also edible. You can eat the carrot eyes that's in the ground, the root, make certain that you know exactly what you're eating because this looks a lot like hemlock the poison hemlock, and they can grow in the same kind of habitat and everything else. So you need to really, before you forage out there and eat things, you need to have a definite positive identification on it. Um, the, the root is a white carrot. It, uh, I say it takes three days for it to chew, to chew it. It's very woody, but it, uh, you know, you can boil it and it is edible, it will, many things are edible. Now, are they tasty? No, but they may sustain you through, you know, hard times and hard winters. You can use the seeds on top uh, and put on top of things and always look inside because there's some little beetles and little spiders that like to hang out in there. Uh, one of the last things we're gonna talk about is harvesting wild rice. And if we were doing this in person, I would have some wild rice here and I would let you try winnowing it. But uh, traditionally, Ho-Chunk, we would move, and we, we still did when I moved, when I lived in Wisconsin, we would do different, and we do here too, different things, different things, different times of the year, because you would eat different plants and use different plants at different times of the year. In September, late, early September, late August, early September is wild racing season. And the stuff you're going after is, it's a grass. It's, a, it's called zinzia, zinzania. And you are going after that. It's on those tall stalks. And traditionally the man would pull the canoe along. Many times they stood up and then the women would take and fold, see how they folded that over into the canoe and they would hit it with a stick are called knocking sticks. You're basically knocking the grain off of the, um, you know, off the stalk. Some of it's gonna go in the water. You want that to happen because then you're, it's going to reseed itself. You can tell it's different than the wild rice you buy in the store because it's a brownish color, it's not a black, and there are lots of different sizes in there. So some are small, some are big, that kind of thing. So um, yes, wild racing is quite fun. Um, we lived in Wisconsin. My husband was working on his PhD in Madison and we went up wild racing in Northern Wisconsin. We took our canoe, we went up there and um, it was uh, first part of September and you go out when the sun first comes up. 
Okay, so you're right out there as the mist is lifting off the lake. And Tim would get in the back of the canoe and pull us along and I'd take an, uh, this is a one time one person can sit in the front of the canoe and face the person in the back of the canoe. So you never want a canoe that way. But uh, yeah, this, and you go very slowly through, you know, through the, the racing lake. And we were watching the elders that were doing this. And, you know, we started and we were doing what they were doing and that kind of thing. At the end of the day, we have our, what, probably 17 foot canoe filled with about three inches of wild rice in the bottom. And if you've ever harvested hay, there's also, uh, you know, a lot of moths and bugs that are out there too. So as we're, you know, getting the bugs out of our hair and everywhere else, uh, we then realize we have made a cardinal mistake of wild racing the first time. And the elder people that are, the elders are just absolutely laughing at us because in the bottom of their canoe, they have put a tarp. And what they did was they got back to shore, they picked up the tarp on each side, pulled it up out of the canoe, tied it up and threw it in the back of their truck and took off. And then, you know, put the canoe on the roof and that kind of thing. Tim and I are standing there looking at a canoe, a 17 foot canoe with three inches of wild rice in the bottom of it and no tarp. So we went and got the rain fly to the tent. We're trying to put the rice on that. Uh, three or four hours later, we've now got all the rice out of the, you know, out of the canoe and we've got it, you know, in the rain fly and then we're ready to go. And the next thing process you have to do, let me see if I have that. Nope. The next process you have to do is you have to dry the wild rice. So we would keep, we're living in an apartment, by the way, and we would put the wild rice in the back of our pickup truck. And then once a day, I would go crawl out in the back of the pickup truck. We have the windows open that it had a cap and that kind of thing on it. Had the windows open, I would take a canoe paddle and stir the rice around in there to get it to dry. You do this for about a week. You can tell when it's dry. And then you have to, you have to parch the rice and you have to winnow the rice. So what we did is, and we, we had then put it on a sheet so we were not, you know, actually messing with it in the truck like that. So we take the sheet filled with wild rice out and we got our Coleman stove out. We got a large kettle out and we are heating the rice up and we are then parching it. To tell to parch it, you're actually trying to get loosen the shaft that's on it, similar to wheat. So you parch it. The next thing you have to do is you have to dance on it. So we toss it in a pickle bucket and I have some special moccasins and very small feet. So I'm jumping around in this pickle bucket, loosening up the shaft because once it's heated, then the shaft loosens and then you winnow it, where it's basically, and this is what I would have you trying, where you throw the rice up in the winnowing basket. It's a birch bark basket that's kind of shaped like this. You throw it up in the air, the air goes through it, and the shaft disappears. We, we're on a picnic table with a Coleman stove, a fan at one end, and we're starting to draw a crowd. The neighbors are asking us, what in the world are you doing? So we're giving, you know, an entire interpretive lesson on what we're doing out there. So we later had them over for wild rice. So, and it's very, very tasty, uh, very nutritional. If uh, my, my people suffer from a lot of diabetes, we have a lot of diabetics, we have trouble with sugars and things, but whole grains like this, are fantastic. So um, yes, and if you find wild rice in the store and it has a expiration date on it, uh, no, wild rice does not expire. You store it in a pillowcase in your freezer. And then when you need some, you take it out, you use a scoop or two of it, and then you put it back. You're storing it in the freezer to keep the bugs out of it, basically. So, okay. Any questions? That's I'm kind of a little over there. Didn't mean to talk that long, but sorry. <laughs> so. No, Karen, that was fabulous. Thank you. Oh, well, thank you. Yeah. So I'm going to go through a list of questions and then I'll invite people to unmute okay. themselves if they want to um, turn their video back on now. They're welcome sure. to. 
Um, so um, first question early on in the presentation, um, in relation to the beaver, did you use the castor gland? Yes, yes, yep. that, yeah, that part, yeah, that would be an oil that we would use, yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. okay. Yep. It's right. kind of smelly. <laughs> oh, is it? So what would you use it for? Uh, it could be used for, um, it, you could burn it from what okay. I've heard. So I've never done it, but yeah, what I've read is that it can be burnt. As a fuel, okay. Yep, um, it's an oil. It's how they keep their skin, yeah. I can add a story about the beaver in that um, one of the things my father did when I was a little kid, and he would help me wash my hair when you're, you know, that two, three-year-old kid and four, five years old, you're leaning over the tub to wash your hair. And uh, we'd finish with that. And then he'd turn the ice cold water on and he would rinse my hair in absolutely freezing cold water. And I'd be screaming and yelling. And his comment was, well, you never saw a beaver with dull hair, did you? So his thought was, I guess, that the cold water was, you know, making shiny hair. But yeah. as we know, that's not true. <laughs> so. Regarding the porcupines, Ellen stated that they were actually extirpated from Indiana. by the Are they? Okay. Darn, we, I'd like to have those guys back. Hi, Ellen. <laughs> I agree with you. Yes. Um, and then uh the mulberry isn't there a native mulberry along with the yes mulberry? yes there is a native mulberry i think we'll have to ask ellen but i'm pretty sure there is yeah ellen are you still on okay yeah. i was with a i was with dawn slack on an invasive survey and she pointed out there is a native mulberry there is a native that's what i thought i think okay. it tends to grow in moist areas so if you see a mulberry in a dry area it's probably not the native okay yeah i think that's what she said a couple comments regarding processing nuts barbara said um with the walnuts as a child we gathered walnuts put them in porous open string bags and leave them in the gravel driveway and roll roll over them for a couple of weeks to remove the husks and one yep. of our winter jobs was then to crack both walnuts and hickory nuts for our use yep. of foods. So that's oh, another, cool. yeah. another way to process. Yep. Um, and then Elizabeth said uh, for black walnuts, my grandpa harvested black walnuts all over the country. He'd keep the hard shells and give them to us. Nothing gets a stuck car traction faster on ice. Ah, good thought. Another use for those. For those all right parts. yeah sure um question uh you mentioned karen using willow for different materials um mm -hmm. do you know your ancestors um used or anybody today would um prune back willow to get the the age or the size of the stems that they wanted for whatever product they were using it for mm -hmm. so i guess like focusing or something would um right. cutting cutting back manipulating it to get the kind of growth that you want for whatever want. product you're making yep we would make willow whistles too my father would make willow whistles with them and also um we baskets could be woven to put the husk in and dropped in the creek to yeah yep okay great thank you sure um somebody asked when you were talking about different um, edibles if the Asian mm -hmm. honeysuckle is edible and somebody else answered that indeed it is not I don't think it is no yeah so it has absolutely no use but havoc exactly okay. <laughs> and what part of bergamot did you use for do you use for deodorant uh the seed the seed pod on top where it's uh there's there's one down in um there's a little plant or a big plant, it's a bush in Tennessee called Bubby Bush. And that one, uh, it might be allspice, I think. And then um, you pinch it, the bergamot, you'd gather it up in a little bundle, pinch it, and then it will be aromatic. There's a little plant or a big plant, it's a bush in Tennessee called Bubby Bush. And that one, uh, it might be allspice, I think. And then, um, you pinch it, the bergamot, you'd gather it up in a little bundle, pinch it, and then it will be aromatic. Okay, great. Very cool. Good to know in a pinch. Heather said, and somebody else agreed with her, as do I, it would be fun to have a native edibles cooking class. Oh, sure. 
um, yep. tasting table. Uh, you, I think, um, I can't remember who it was. It might have been Native American Cultural Center, either at IU or Purdue. Um, mm-hmm. They were potentially going to be offering some programming around doing some cooking. Oh, neat. With neat. Natives. So, yep. yeah, but it would sure. be something fun to do locally at some point, too. Brooke? Hi, George and Betsy. Hi, Brooke. Brooke. Yeah. Brooke, yeah, Brooke, this is Coletta. Here. Here. Hi, Coletta. <laughs> I want to, I wonder if people can see these wonderful porcupine earrings you made for me. Oh, yeah. From the I didn't quilt. talk about those. Yeah, I make porcupine quill earrings. Well, thank you. Oh, yeah. very cool. I wear them a lot. <laughs> All right. Yay. <laughs> those are beautiful, Karen. That's awesome. So oh, thank you. Um, let's see. Now, over in the chat right now, uh, Shakti is saying, FYI, Common questions about uh, bergamot oil used in Earl Grey, Grey tea. What is bergamot? It's a deliciously aromatic citrus fruit, likely a natural hybrid of a sour orange and a lemon or citron ah, with a okay. sharp, intensely citrus flavor and sour zing. The ah, okay. The size okay. of an orange, yet similar in color to a lime. Bergamots are relatively juicy and low in seeds, but the most popular part of the fruit is the rinds or zest. Which is ah, okay. I'll have to look oil. that up. Um, I still have the leaves in my tea, but you know, yeah, like, that's what I'm familiar with as well. Yeah. Yep. And then um, Alicia, and I was wondering when she was talking about the size of the fruit, um, Alicia mentions that bergamot, the fruit, is different from bergamot. Bergamot. Flat, okay. Is, okay. Yeah, I was wondering about the Thank you. The fruit. Thanks for correcting that. Yes. yes. Um, Okay, yeah, thank you, Alicia. Yes, thank right. you. Um, you have a lot of kudos and thank you so oh, much thank you. in the chat. So, um, and I, I can't agree more. Oh, um, thank you. So much great information that you shared here today. Um, I'm a naturalist, it's hard to get us to shut up. So, yeah. <laughs> I didn't want you to shut up, so. <laughs> yeah. um, Tell us to shut up at some point, yeah. <laughs> No, yeah. I could listen for you forever. This is great. Oh, thank you. Um, I want to, um, uh, Shakti asked, do you sell your earrings on Easy? I bet she meant Etsy or online. I have not, but uh, my brothers told me I should when he was alive. So yeah, yes. Sounds like yes, I make a lot. I make a lot of them. Yes. So, yep. Okay. Next career, maybe? Next career, yes. Okay. Yes. Awesome. And, you know, even there's certain times of the year as a Native person when you're supposed to make them versus when you're not, you're supposed to do crafty stuff. You know, I've learned in the winter, not in the summer, you're busy harvesting and spring and all that kind of thing. So, yep. That makes sense. That makes there's sense. There's Coletta. <laughs> I'm trying to get them up here. <laughs> get them out there. You got them. There they are. Yep. That's really interesting what you say about the seasonality of making different products from, mm-hmm. from different materials and stuff yep. be it because of everything else that's going on in one's life in that season or maybe because of the mm-hmm. plant itself. Um, that's great. Um, somebody's asking, Elizabeth is asking, what is the na- what is the legend of the syrup? She might have been the one who earlier oh. there was a comment I didn't understand about m- maple seeds. Oh, maple seeds? Oh, I don't but, know. But here she's asking the legend of the syrup. syrup. All right, the legend of the maple syrup. Uh, I know two of them. I'll tell you the whole chunk one that I know. I also know a um, a Jibwa one. But uh, the whole chunk story that I know, and uh, just FYI, if you are at a program and a Native person is telling a story or a legend, if they do not give you permission, to retell that story or that legend, then you are not supposed to do that, okay? I know that this probably sounds very strange, but yeah, I give everybody permission to retell this story if you so desire. So um, the story that I learned is that uh, we believe in an earth maker, there's what my family did, and then we have uh, earth maker put people on the earth. He put original man on the earth and then he would watch down from above as to what was going on. And when original man was here originally, 
he was given all of the things that he needed to survive, but he had to work for them. And then, but he gave him one special, special treat that after the long, hard winters in Wisconsin, that if he had worked hard and had survived the winter, had had enough venison and, you know, duck potatoes and things like that, and the family had survived, then in the spring, there was something very special that they could have. They could go out to the maple tree and cut into the bark. They made a cut on each side. And then what would come out originally was syrup, just straight syrup. It was not watered down. It was thick. It was wonderful. And you could have that as your special treat for the long, hard winter that you had, had been through. So what, what happened is, uh, you know, original man was, you know, busy working, but then he started to get lazy, all righty, and we weren't working quite as hard, and we had, um, you know, it started to be a bit of a slouch, or nowadays I say a couch potato, and so we're just kind of sitting around there being a couch potato and not doing what we're supposed to be doing. So we went out in the spring and made slits into the maple tree to get the sap and installed the elderberry spile. And we had put that in. And instead of getting this wonderful syrup out of the tree, the stuff that came out was water. And it just looked like complete water. And and it was a little bit sweet, but not like it was before. If you tried to put it on something, everything got soggy. It was just not what you really wanted. So they had a little meeting or a little, I call it a little confab or a little powwow. They got together. So what Earthmaker told original man is said, I'm sorry, you did not keep up. And I've kind of you know, modified this for the normal, you know, for nowadays, you know, you haven't kept up with the agreement. And since you're not working as hard as you were working before, now you're going to have to work for this syrup and told them what they had to do. They, if, that it was going to take 40 gallons of the sap to make one gallon of syrup. And then you had to work for this. If, this, if you want this sweetness, you really are gonna to have to work for it. And so that's why today we have to tap the tree and we have to boil it down to get the sap to turn into syrup. So that's the whole chunk story that I know. Now, if, if um, uh, I say an elder here, I am with gray hair, right? Uh, if someone else was telling us this might be something that might take three hours or, you know, over, couple of nights. So, you know, that kind of thing. So it was, and this would be told by the older folks, the elder folks to the kids and the kids would gather around. And it was uh, when we would tell stories, it would teach patience to children that, uh, you know, and you did not interrupt, you did not, which is very hard to do. And you had to sit and you had to listen. So that's, that's kind of a tradition. So, yep. We had kids at all our activities when I go places and yeah, if you even went to a tribal meeting, there's kids there running around because that's the next generation. So, yep. So um, a lot of history, yep. origin, <laughs> myth, morals, that sort of thing passed yep. down orally, yep. right? Yep. And being a kid that grew up in the 60s and 70s, uh, when we were fighting for women's lib and everything else, when you look back at your native culture, there are definitely male roles and female roles. And those two do not cross. So, so that's, that's kind of a different thing to live with too. So, yep. Karen, you do so much. You do all of your work as a naturalist, <laughs> well, all of your work for Indiana Native Plant Society. Um, I had the best time working with you when we tabled our, the Earth Day 
festival this year. Yes, um, we had a blast. Yeah. I'd have a blast. Yeah. We gave out a lot of native plants. That was wonderful. So just um, thank you for everything that you do. Well, thank you. For time to be here tonight. Sure. To put together your presentation and, and share your knowledge and your history. Well, thank you. It was, it was fun. <laughs>